Thank you, Peter. Thank you, the American Numismatic Society, for inviting me to give this talk tonight. And this is indeed the 25th year, six, going on 26th year since my summer seminar project started. Um, and it just goes to show that you need to revisit these topics every so often because in 1994, I was invited to come back and give a talk based on this and I thought then that I'd mastered it. And then in, in 2011, I published on it and I thought then, oh no, this will be the final word. And then, no, no, this is not the final word. But tonight, I can say. <laughs> And as far as part of my presentation goes, I do, I can say, we have some conclusions to make. The project I'm presenting this, uh, this evening began a number of years ago during my summer seminar. Carmen Arnold Buki and Harold Mattingly assigned me a topic that they said needed doing. A die study of the later coins of Corinth. Admittedly, I had no idea what I was getting myself into, but I was young and full of vigor. Despite having been one of the earliest Greek mints, <coughs> Corinth's production remains imperfectly understood. Despite the fact that it has been the subject of a major study in the early 20th century, we still do not have a good handle on the coinage minted on the, from the mid-4th century to the closure of the mint. The goal of my project is to resolve the puzzle of late Corinthian coinage. This has been and still is an enormous project. While the study is still not finished, there are always more coins to examine, as we all know. This afternoon, I'll present the state of my research at, the, at this point and the conclusions I've drawn thus far. <clears throat> Among these conclusions are a stable, well-supported relative chronology of the mint in the late 4th and early 3rd centuries, and suggestions for a new absolute chronology for the mint at Corinth. Before I get started, I should get, give a bit of historical background. This study is concerned strictly with the activity of the mint after 360, but the mint had operated for more than a century and a half before that. As an important trading center, it is no surprise that Corinth played an important role in the expansion of the Greeks to the Western Mediterranean by founding a number of colonies, including Syracuse in Sicily. Corinth was also one of the first three Greek cities to mint silver coinage, probably beginning in the last quarter of the, of the 6th century, around the time when Athens and Aegina also started minting. It was a good start, but by the end of the 5th century, Corinth had met with mixed fortunes and came out as a second-rate power. After the Peloponnesian War, several cities, including Corinth, was agitated against Spartan hegemony to the point that hostilities broke out in 396, the so-called Corinthian War, which was only settled in 387 by the King's Peace. Although this was a rough time for the Corinthia, full of disruption, after 387, the city seems to have continued minting coin and engaging in trade. Corinth was impotent as a power in Greek mainland affairs and seldom appears in the sources for the next several decades. Weakness on the mainland, however, did not keep Corinth from participating in activities overseas. In 344, as a result of requests from the citizens of Syracuse, Corinth sent out Timoleon with some mercenaries to drive out, oops, yeah, there it is, Corinth, ta-da, there we go, that's the one I want. Uh, in 344, as a result of requests from the citizens of Syracuse, Corinth sent out Timoleon with some mercenaries to drive out Dionysius II, tyrant in their former colony. In this expedition, Corinth may have drawn upon its allies and some of its former colonies, such as Lefkas and Kirkra, for manpower assistance. Diodor Siculus reports that Timoleon was short of cash on his Sicilian adventure and recounts how he had to send out raiding parties into Carthaginian territories to acquire funds, and also that mercenaries became restive over the lack of pay. Timoleon was wildly successful fighting the forces arrayed against him in Syracuse so that later reinforcements sent out as a result of the initial victory brought funds for recruiting mercenaries in Sicily. In 341, he defeated a large Carthaginian force at the Cremisus River and sent a great deal of booty back to Corinth. Timoleon deserves much credit for the resurgence of Greek Sicily, and with that doubt, Corinth profited considerably from this revival. And the reason I mention all of this is because of the flood of Corinthian coinage that comes into Sicily in the same period. 
This overseas theater is quite different from the role Corinth played in mainland Greek affairs. After his conclusive victory at Chironia, Philip II placed a Macedonian garrison on Acre Corinth and created the Hellenic Symmachia, based at Corinth. Given its strategic uh, location, it's not surprising that Corinth remained garrisoned for more than a century. In spite of the garrisons throughout this period, there's no literary evidence that Philip, Alexander, or, or any of the Diadochi in control of Corinth instituted controls over the regular institutions of the administration, including the Mint. Personnel may have changed, but the general production of the Mint seems to have continued and at times it increased considerably. After Alexander III's death in 323, the city came under the control of Polyperchon and his family. In 309, Ptolemy I took it and set up his own garrisons, but then withdrew, perhaps in 306 or 305, leaving, leaving the city to Cassander. The sources are unclear concerning the year in which Ptolemy force, Ptolemy's forces withdrew, but it may have even been as late as 304. Regardless, Cassander had putative control of Corinth only until 303, when Demetrius Poliarchetes took the city and garrisoned Acre Corinth. He was extremely active in the Corinthia and was minting heavily after 290 in preparation for an invasion of Asia Minor. Corinth passed, control, passed into the control of his son, Antigonus Gennatos, when Demetrius left in 287 on what turned out to be his last campaign. He was captured by Seleucus in 285, and in 283 Demetrius died in captivity. Corinth remained under Antigone control until 243, when the city was freed by Eridus and joined the Achaean Koinon. The city changed hands several more times between the Koinon and the Antigonids, but its ultimate fate rested with Lucius Mummius, who destroyed the city in 146. There. Now we have the historical background necessary to appreciate the context of the coinage. Let's have some numismatics. <laughs> Corinth minted its earliest silver staters in the last quarter of the 6th century and continued to mint ir irregularly until 146. The silver coinage followed a standard similar to the Attic Ubiac standard in that the Pegasi weighed, weighed 8.6 grams, the equivalent of an Attic didram although I've learned today that the whole question of standards is kind of up in the air a bit. So this will be resolved by Uta and uh, Peter later, I'm sure. <laughs> the ethnic, the archaic kappa on the obverse, highlighted here, will remain the same single letter for the length of the Greek myth's production. Although staters originally had a union jack pattern on the reverse, this was eventually replaced with a helmeted female head in an in square. Corinth also struck fractional denominational coinage irregularly after the early period. There were trihemidram, the dram, the hemidram, diobal, triobal, or I, sh I should say trihemiobal, obals, hemiobals, and a limited and a limited bronze coinage beginning in the fourth century. The obverse and reverse types of all the coins remain the same throughout the life of the Greek mint, all tied to the Bellerophon myth that was so important to Corinthian identity. As far as chronology, we should start at the beginning. Corinthian coinage received scholarly attention in the late 19th century, but it was not until Oscar Revelle published his two-volume study in 1936 and 48 that a study of the staters from its inception down to their termination was completed. Ravel set up a framework for the mint upon which others have built, focusing exclusively on the staters and drawing on a die study and stylistic analysis supplemented with some hordes. Ravel organized the coinage into six periods, as you can see here. He tried to establish firm dates for each of the periods with mixed success. Although his absolute chronology has been adjusted, you can see where the question marks have it's been it's still undergoing adjustment his six periods have remained the way we way scholars analyze and discuss the coinage since my study is only concerned with periods five and six i'm going to ignore periods one through three and only treat period four as it relates to the current study period four which Ravel thought ran from 415 to 387 
is identified by what Ravel characterized as staters of good new style on both obverse and reverse dies, accompanied by various symbols on the obverse, which you can see here on this coin. Period five, which he dated from 387 to 307, 307, Ravel characterized as staters of good style, with the Pegasi always portrayed flying and the Athena on the reverse accompanied by symbols and letters, both single letters and double letters. He concluded, as had everyone else, that the letters must be the initials of mint magistrates and that the symbols, which repeated with different letters, were some other control mark. The fact that there are over 60 symbols, sometimes repeated, has made a mess of trying to figure out exactly what these symbols and letters mean. Period 6, which he dated from 306 to 300, he characterized as being rustic, awful, rough. He used all three different words in different places in his monographs. From here out, we'll confine ourselves mostly to period five, with an occasional dive into period six at the end. In addition to setting out an absolute chronology, Ravel attempted to set out the relative chronology of period five by putting the letters in order in which they were minted. In doing so, he identified 12 series you can see them here and they're made possible because as you saw from the previous slide each one of these period five coins has a different letter along with its symbol he did not attempt to put the symbols in order he did this uh, largely on the basis of style although he did also use hoard evidence to anchor the last three series of period five a point to which i'll return the next scholar to devote attention to period five was g kenneth jenkins of the british museum Jenkins, drawing on ex his extensive experience working with hordes, realized that Ravel's chron relative chronology for period five was flawed. Using recently published data on hordes, he rearranged the first three series. So we get Ravel on the right and Jenkins' modification of this on the left. Then in 1986, with improved and additional hoard data available, Jenkins made a slight tweak to his relative chronology, rejecting an earlier assertion that single letters must come before the doubles. So you can see all these switched around now is the alpha, lambda, and alphas, which he's moved further to the, to the four. As you'll notice, Jenkins placed the epsilon and the new series first because they appear in early hordes, uh, along with period four staters. The position of these two series is further supported by evidence from overstrikes of Metapontum and Tarentum. Examination of overstrikes on Corinthian, coins, Corinthian staters by, by Ann Johnston for Metapontum and Fisher Bossert for Tarentum confirmed that the Epsilon and New series must be the first two. It also confirms the date for the start of period 5 to around 350, a few years before Timoleon was sent to Sicily. The Epsilon series of drams is extremely small, currently limited to one example known. Let's take a quick look at the Horde evidence to see how it is that Jenkins came up with this relative chronology. Now there's a lot of information here. Don't worry about what's in white. What's in yellow is what is of interest to us. And what you'll notice right away, you look up there, you see pe two period fours, E, Period 4, E, period 4, E. Now we get some Ns show up with these early hordes uh, where you're still getting period 4. Now we get the Alpha Lambda showing up. This is why this horde is why Jenkins readjusted re his chronology. Again, Alpha Lambda, Alpha. Some Deltas poking up here and there. Also, we get more period 4, E. No new in this, this case. Alpha Lambdas, Alphas, and now Strangely enough, a Delta Yoda, not where Ravel expected, nor where Jenkins expected it. Um, and then in this horde, Epsilon's news, Deltas and Delta Yodas, but again, no, no good sense. And here at the bottom, I've got Jenkins' chronology, so you can see how it is that he looked at this information and came to this conclusion. So you get a sense of the, the groups that should be probably near the four. Now as far as the end of the period five series, trying to set up that chronology, 
what we find is that the Heliamati Horde, which Ravel knew about, it had been found in 1932, and what sets the Heliamati Horde apart is, as you can see, contains uh, drachmas of Corinth, and it also contains Ptolemaic tetradrams. It also contains Ptolemaic drams. Um, the Ptolemaic tetradrams and drams both have mint marks of Delta Omicron. And what Ravel noticed was that the Ptolemaic drams and the Corinthian drams both were mint condition. They nowhere at all. Uh, no sign of anywhere. He also noticed that in his view the same hand had made the Delta Omicron on the Ptolemaic coins as had made the Delta Omicron on the Corinthian coins. He therefore concluded that the Heliamati Horde must date to the end of Ptolemaic control of Corinth. It was buried at the time that the Ptolemaic uh, troops were leaving the city, a time of transition, a time of uncertainty in the city, and that's why the Horde wasn't recovered, um, and that's how he anchored the end of his uh, ranking. You'll notice also f among the Corinthian coins, if you look at the numbers, 38 Delta Iota coins, 14 Delta Omicron coins. This contributed, along with the alf nine Alpha Upsilon coins, to why both Jenkins and Ravel put those three series at the end of their chronology. Um, they, are, they had some other hordes, but no other hordes measure up quite to the extent of the Heliamati horde. So this is how um, everybody has come with these three series at the end. But that's a problem with this. Uh, there are several problems with this. One of them is, if this is where the Delta Yoda goes, then why does Delta Yoda show up in several early hordes? And skipping all the other letters is a surprise. The other crazy, or the other unexpected thing is the Delta here is listed as the third series. And we find it in, and we find it in early hordes. Um, so it clearly is an early series. And yet, um, here it is showing up in this horde in a small quantity, but it's still here. No epsilon, no nu, um, and a number of other letter combinations also missing. So that was a bit of confusion, a bit of a problem from the hordes. There's also another problem. In 1968, let me go to this, 1968, Jennifer Warren had done a dye study of, the, of some of the trihemidrams of Corinth. She had identified a dye link between the delta and delta iota trihemidrams. According to the chronologies, which you can see here at the bottom, such a dye link can't possibly exist. Doesn't match up with anything that Jenkins or Ravel had suggested. Both Ravel and Jenkins were explicit in that their period five chronologies were imperfect because there was no dye study. The reason was the volume of coinage. Numerous ancient mints, coinage survives in quantities we can work with, though there are exceptions. Period five staters of Corinth survive in such enormous quantities that it's too large a group to handle. Calciati, who published a study of Pegasi in 1990, estimated conservatively that there were more than 17,000 staters known. He underestimated considerably. Is it, there's at least 25,000. Um, out there between uh, museums and, and uh, holdings that have passed through auction catalogs. I know I've seen every coin in every auction catalog in the last many years. Uh, the actual number is much greater, but what makes it even more difficult is that Ravel thought that the period five mint had changed the way it was making and using dyes. He argued that they seemed to have been using them in strict pairs so that when one die broke, an obverse or a reverse, he, Ravel thought they were throwing out both dies. The reason he thought this was because he was having so much difficulty finding die links between the, uh, between the different coins. It now seems, for example, Ravel found 300 different reverses, reverse dies, in the coins with the letter alpha plus the symbols helmet and astralagos. So he concluded a die study was, was not practicable, and I agree with him. A die study is not practicable of the staters. I also think Ravel was wrong. Uh, I don't think they're throwing out both dies when one breaks. I think the problem is there are so many coins and there are so many die links that he, he just couldn't see enough coins to see the die links. 
And so what looks like you're throwing out two different dyes is actually the case the volume is too great. Um, yeah, 25,000 coins is a lot to keep in your head. What it means for my study is that there are many, many more dyes, fewer dye combinations, and you'd have to manage many thousands of coins. And scholars of the past, we tend to whine about how, and legitimately, we lack sources. <laughs> We don't have this, we don't have that, and we don't have the other thing. But in the case of the Corinthian staters, we actually have too much evidence. Mm -hmm. So what Carmen and Harold thought I should do, instead of focusing on the staters, which was impossible, and Alan Stahl told me that two people have gone insane trying to do dye studies of the staters, they suggested, and I agreed with them, that going after the drams, the, uh, the uh, small denomination coinage, might be more effective. And that's how my study works. Uh, my study comes at this problem through the fractional coinage, particularly the drams. During par period five and six, the mint struck a numerous supply of drams that share the same letters and sometimes the same symbols as the staters. But the drams, while sufficiently numerous for a study, are not overwhelming in number. Having the drams, I gathered, having the drams, I gathered my coins and started a die study the only way to be certain of the correct chronology issues. And since not everybody, and this is the drams showing both, this is, has one, one of the letters on it and other drams have letters and symbols on them, as we'll see. Uh, since not everyone here is a numismatist, I want to say something about how a die study works. In a die study, we identify different dies, and we look for the patterns of use. Because every coin retains the impression of the two dyes used to make it, a dye study can reveal the relationship between different coins, like DNA analysis, which coins come from the same dyes and which coins do not. Let me illustrate. And what you have here is the, uh, the curator of the Alpha Bank was very generous to uh, help me out with this. And you can see in this picture, we have an obverse dye. And we can think of that as the reverse die. These are obviously modern recreations, but you get the idea. <coughs> the way that the dies work, your obverse die is set into your anvil so it won't move. You put your, in, your intricate engraving upon that. You then originally remember the Union Jack symbol that you had on those early staters is because, of course, you can't be sure that your engraving will work. You probably are not holding it in your hand. In the ancient world, you're probably holding it in, someone's holding it with tongs or something similar. One person whacks it. You've got a metal flan in here of silver. The obverse die and the reverse die. Because the reverse die is getting struck by the hammer so often, it's going to break more often than the obverse die. And as these things break, they're going to have to be replaced. And what you're looking for is where two different reverse dies share the same obverse dies because they've broken at different rates. And we can see that in this example. Here we have the obverse, these are the obverses, which, eh, no, it doesn't, there we go. These are the obverse of a dr two obverses of drams, and here are linked reverses. Deltiotas, both of them. And so that's what we're looking for in our die study. Um, in, th in this case, we have two obverse dies that link up and two different reverses. And we'll show this in our illustration um, in a manner like this, where this round, where the round, uh, s s where the round circle, where the round circles, um, where the round numbers are the obverses and where the squares are the reverses, and you can see how complex, complicated these kinds of relationships uh, can be. All right, that's how we do it. That's what makes it possible. Once I'd collected a reasonably large number of drams and analyzed them, I started identifying dyes and looking for links. The first link I found was one I found right here at the INS in 1993, um, the Alpha and Alpha Lambda series. I just happened to be looking at the tray. Look down and these two obverse dyes uh, jumped together. Uh, on the, as you can see on the left. This link confirmed Jenkins' 1986 chronology, so all was good. And at, in all of these slides, I keep Jenkins' chronology here on the right-hand side. Uh, the letters in yellow are the ones that I've seen come together. 
The second link, however, was between a delta and a delta iota dram. As already noted, this was the same series link Jennifer Warren had found in the trihemidrams, confirming, uh, confirming, Jennifer's, uh, confirming Warren's work uh, meant that the series links were consistent across denominations. But knowing there was a link didn't automatically indicate which came first, delta or delta iota. It also didn't indicate where in this series those two coins were going to go. You can see from Jenkins' chronology, delta should have been early, delta iota should have been late. Warren's link had been dismissed because some people were unaware of it and it was considered an outlier because of it was a fractional coinage. More analysis was required. The next series to link up was the Iota and the Delta Iota series. Now I knew that the Delta Iota series was in the middle between the Iotas and the Deltas, which I think I have there. Uh, Iota and Delta series. I'm not going to show you all of my links because that would require about three hours. Mm -hmm. I think we all have less than three hours to spend. In addition to the die links and the hoard analysis, style can help suggest places where series may be related. Ravel and Jenkins had both recognized as stylistically the Alpha Rho, Gamma, and Iota series belong together because of the wing execution on the obverse dies. Now these three coins are all staters of these three groups, Alpha Rho, Gamma, and Iota. You can see how similar the uh, wings are. One of the things I noticed when working on the drams is it's very clear that the same engravers are working on the drams as are working on the staters because the wings get finished the same, uh, the legs get finished the same, many of the features are similar. So stylistically, these three have to go together. They don't necessarily link, but they do have to go together. In the process of assembling my evidence, I also ran into a previously unrecorded letter group on several drams that stylistically looked much more similar to period 5 than to period 6. So now I have this, and then I found that. This was the NO series, New Omicron. And it must belong to period 5 stylistically. Thomas Martin had suggested in 1985 in a footnote um, that this might be the case, but nobody had noticed it, including myself back in 93. It's been found in later hordes, and it is associated with a large issue of posthumous Alexander tetradrams, which must also be later. So we now have an additional series in period 5. Based on the single obverse die thus far in the drams and two reverse dies, it seems to have been a small issue of drams despite the enormous volume of n new Omicron tetradrams. And that brings us, well, I don't have that. Since publishing the first results of this study, more evidence for the placement of the Delta series late in the chronology has emerged. As we've already noticed, the Horde evidence supports that Delta should be early and the Delta Yoda should be late. Turns out that the Delta and Alpha Upsilon series are dilinked. Additional support emerges in the posthumous tetradrams minted in Corinth, probably by Polyperchon, Alexander, or Cratocepolis. One of the letter series appearing on posthumous tetradrams minted in Corinth is the Delta with a wreath, sometimes inside, sometimes outside the wreath. A letter symbol combination that also appears on drams and staters of period 5, as you can see here. Uh, these are two drams, delta inside a wreath. Here's a delta inside a wreath. Uh, the delta is really hard to make out, uh, but this also appears on staters of Corinth in this period. Given that this remains a contradiction with the Hoard evidence, the most likely solution must be that the delta appears twice, early and late. A suggestion also made by Warren. Uh, though she had no evidence for it at the time. That the mint reused the letter is bolstered by an unexpected dialing. It turns out that some of the Alpha Lambda series coins have the letters marked on top of the heads. You can see them here and here and even here on the head of this uh, chimera. Along with the letters on top of the head, is the symbol Quiros behind, which, ah, there it is, here, 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 and here. 
There are also several Delta Yoda series drams that have letters marked on top of the head, instead of below the chin or behind the head. And these two share the Quira symbol. It turns out they're dilinked. Thus, the Delta Yoda are dilinked with Alpha Lambda, along with being dilinked with Yoda and Delta. Several of the Delta series drams also have the Quira symbol on the reverse, and this same symbol appears on Delta stators and trihemidrams. The obverse types of these Delta Quiris drams are extremely similar in style to the Alpha Lambda obverses, so similar that they must have been carved by the same engraver or at least in the same shop. All of these links, dies, symbols, and style further suggest that the Delta, Delta Yoda, and Alpha Lambda series belong together. This is consistent with the appearance of Delta and Alpha Lambda in early hordes. Therefore, we can say Delta and Delta Yoda series definitely belong to the beginning of the period and to the end. The reason for Delta Yoda may not the reason the Delta Yoda may not show up in early hordes so much is because it was a small issue. Uh, in the dram so far, this early issue of Delta Yoda is only known from one obverse and one reverse die thus far out of three examples. The last die link to appear in the series is between Alpha and Alpha Rho. This link completes the relative chronology. As you can see there. And this also showed, uh, proves absolutely that Jenkins was right, that the double letters don't have to follow single letters, uh, which was an assumption that both um, that Ravel and Jenkins' early work had made. The Gamma series does not actually share dyes with any series of drams. But as already noted, it is stylistically related to the Alpha Rho and Iota series, so it belongs in the only remaining place, right in the middle. The relative chronology for period 5 is now set. I've hunted for additional links with luck, I've tested this chronology up and down, back and forth, it's stable and it holds up. I should also say a few words about this new relative how this new relative chronology affects the absolute chronology for Corinth. Is, yeah, this is Cray's and Jenkins. Uh, Colin Cray and G.K. Jenkins um, have, a, have a, a chronology that revised what Ravel had proposed. Uh, Ravel had proposed that period four uh, ends in 387. Cray and Jenkins had downdated it to Timoleon. Um, and period five, Jenkins had set from 344 to 306 or so, and period six from 306 down to 243. Cray and Jenkins recognized that Ravel had to be wrong about period 6. Ravel had argued that period 6 would fit between 306 and 300, uh, or 302. And that is impossible. There are too many dies. You can't fit it all within that five-year period. Um, but to give uh, credit where credit is due, Ravel simply hated period 6. <laughs> um, he also had very few staters from period 6 to work with, to be fair. Based on McDonald's, David McDonald's work on the flood of Pegasi into Sicily and the overstrikes in, the Tarent in, the, in Tarentum, period five must still begin a little before time of Timoleon's expedition, a date supported by external evidence from hordes and overstrikes. Uh, come back to this in a minute. The terminus of period five, however, can no longer remain in the fourth century. Ravel, Jenkins, and Cray relied on the burial date of the Hiliamati Horde for their date of the closing of the Mint. While the Delta Omicron dra drowns of Ptolemy show that the Mint used the Delta Omicron series during his stay at the Mint, it is not certain that they stopped using that series when Ptolemy abandoned Corinth in 306 or 304. There are no Delta Omicron staters. But there are posthumous Alexander tetradrams minted in Corinth that use the Delta Omicron letter combination, and the presence of these accounts for the lack of Corinthian staters. Whether these belong to Ptolemy is less certain, though some have appeared in hordes found in Asia Minor. The fact that the new Omicron series also belongs with period 5 brings a significant change to the chronology. Given the number of new Omicron series tetradrams that have been recovered in 3rd century hordes from Greece and Asia Minor, these were most likely struck by Demetrius Poliarchetes during his control of Corinth. He needed coin on hand to pay his mercenaries, and he minted heavily at all of his mints in the years leading up to his invasion of Anatolia in 287. 
Once he had departed, the mint may have continued to mint in his name, but there was surely less need to mint coins for the war in Asia, as it would have been cumbersome and risky to ship coins clear across the Aegean for the, into, into Asia Minor. Soon after his coin capture in 285, word reached Corinth that Demetrius had been taken. It's unlikely that the mint continued to mint that the mint continued to issue coin in his name after 285 when his son Antigonus was in control and it was certainly not have done after 283 when Demetrius died in captivity. So I suggest that the end of period 5 should be around 285 BC. My dice study has not, drawn, has not thus far drawn many conclusions about Ravel's period 6. Except for the chronology. As you recall, period 6 is characterized by rough style types and the use of monogram mint marks. What I can say about period 6, and you can see how different this looks from the coins we've seen before now. What I can say about period 6 is that the staters must end around 243 when Corinth joined the Achaean League, and that Cray and Jenkins were correct. But the volume of dyes for the drams is too great to shoehorn them all into the period 285 to 243. There are simply too many. In addition to that, hoard evidence from Albania shows that these coins were still in circulation and there are mint versions of uh, Corinthian drams showing up in hoards dated to 180 and 160 BCE. The coin types remain the same, though their style continues to be erratic and rough. The use of new letters and some symbols continues along with ligatures and monograms in period 6. It appears likely that this period needs to be reorganized into at least two and probably three periods. And I thank Uta for this suggestion. <laughs> also, it seems necessary to redefine the weight standard after 243, below that used in earlier issues, because period six almost universally uh, weighs, less than, weighs much less than we would have expected. I, I expect that much more will emerge from this analysis as I dive deeply into period six material. In conclusion, we know three things about Corinthian coinage we didn't know two years ago. We have an additional series in period five, the new Omicrons. We have a new stable relative chronology confirmed through a die study. We also have a superior sense of the mint's absolute chronology, which must come down to 285 for period five. And we also know that period six is larger and much more complex than Ravel imagined. And that the coin types for the staters, whoops, Missed word there. And the coin type of the staters, as well as all the other coins, must tie back to the Bellerophon tale, and therefore it must be Athena and not Aphrodite on any of the Corinthian coins. I have an article coming out on this next year. More analysis awaits, but I expect the result will confirm that this mint issue has much to tell us about Corinth and the economy of central Greece and the Peloponnesus in a significant period of political transition. Thank you. Any questions?